Hey guys, today on the podcast, I have, well, a an amazing show. Um, this is a world-class education. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that it's all visual. There are exercises that are going to make you feel better. There's slideshows, information, but it, for the most part, this is like an 80% interactive podcast. Uh, oh, by the way, our guest today is Eric Franklin. Eric is the creator of the Franklin Method. Um, basically, he is going to show you how to feel amazing and how to move your body, how to lift your mood, how to just change everything about how you function in life, if if you pay attention. Um, also, if, if you actually experience this and follow along. Uh, again, fantastic show. This is worth it. Uh, sitting down and watching or or, no excuse me don't sit down and watch do it this is worth doing so if you like to listen to the show in the car yeah go ahead and listen to it because the information is fantastic but you're also going to want to do a take two and actually uh, go go visual Um, anyway guys thanks so much for tuning in this is a phenomenal show with eric franklin about the franklin method pull up a chair and buckle up it's the original strength podcast Eric Franklin, thank you for being with us. (laughs) Hello, everyone, and welcome. That's watching. Um, I'm broadcasting from the lovely but cold country of Switzerland, and we're going to be talking about the Franken method, which happens to also carry my name. And some of you might have heard of imagery and kinesis, so it's very much related to that. But first, maybe my story. So I was on a rather you know, intellectual path, um, educated in the sciences and so forth. But I decided I wanted to be a dancer, (laughs) big change. And, um, you know, that's not so easy. I was like 40, 45 years ago. And there weren't that many options really at that point. But I ended up um, getting a degree in biomechanics and movement science from the University of Zurich, by the way, the same school Einstein went to. I can always brag, you know. (laughs) <laughs> and then NYU that's where um, Woody Allen went to the school of the arts I went to the same school for dance for three years so I have a, a degree in science biomechanics a degree in dance and I started dancing and I got issues all over my body my knees hurt my back hurt and I thought well what I've been taught at the university and also now in my trainings there's something missing and I looked around, of course, um, you know, what, what are the things we, you know, you can do to create change, to train your body. And I, I stumbled upon imagery. And I can tell you right off why I like imagery. First of all, there's a huge amount of evidence that it works. Um, you know, right now, fashion is very popular. There's 10 times more evidence that imagery improves movement than for fascia, just as an example. Uh, yeah, so the science is really, really super solid. Um, imagery and using your mind, it's free. It's always available. You always have your brain with you. Um, it improves flexibility, strength, synchronization, reaction time, force absorption. So many things have been shown. Also improves um, cognitive things. It improves cognition, improves confidence. Um, focus. So all these things have been shown that they work and it's free and it's available and can be adapted to any pathology and it's highly conservative. So there we have it. That's why I'm kind of a fan. And and ideally, of course, you combine it with movement. And the other thing to say about it, just so a little bit about my history, when I started then um, after many years of developing my method, I started teaching yoga teachers, Pilates teachers, you know, a lot of different you know, mythologies, and they all use imagery. And I had a big surprise waiting for me. They use imagery, but they don't teach imagery. In other words, if you ask them, so what is imagery? You're using all these images. What is it? You know, you just get this blank stare. and They give you another example of an image. And I went, just a second. (laughs) That's a problem. If one of the tools, let's say you're using a dumbbell, right, or something, or, uh, you know, away someone asks you so why are you using that and you go well we just use it you know it's like something we use and you will give an explanation well we're talking about resistance training blah 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 right so i thought oh wow there's there's definitely a need for some training in this area and that's how kind of the training started yeah like that 
And then I worked with the Swiss uh, Olympic gymnastics team, and I worked with swimmers and runners, and finally, I ended up uh, working a lot for dancers, and then also, you know, taught a lot of Pilates and yoga teachers, and a lot of them are now, you know, teaching uh, Frank-Amanted imagery and so forth. So that's sort of the development. That happened very naturally. So I, I didn't uh, think, oh, I want to have a brand, you know, me, brand, like that. Not at all. It just... From a need that I saw, I developed uh, what we're going to do. So now let's do some practical stuff. So for that, we're going to start just to get a little bit into our body. If you wouldn't mind standing up, we're going to tap our body a little bit. So you can just tap up the right and down the left. So a tapping does, obviously, it makes you more aware, wakes up the proprioceptors, exteroceptors, and so forth. We can also do a little leg tapping, just whatever is comfortable, all around. Just a little bit of tapping. You know, if you're comfortable, all the way down to the feet. And if not, of course, just leave that part out. Then we're going to tap our glutes, so a little bit glute tapping. Then we're going to do a little lower back, like that. And it's always good to make a sound if you want to release tension. So if you want to go, uh, like that, it's an awe as you, right? Uh, uh, good. Then the general air in the diaphragm, like that. Excellent. Sternum. And then just a little bit of neck tapping, very gentle neck, neck tapping with fingertips, skull, all around jaw. Very good. Excellent. Then we're going to take our left arm and tap it with our right hand. So you start at the fingertips, you go all the way up to the shoulders and even the neck, and you tap all around the arm. There we go. Tap all around the arm. Good. And then we're going to brush over the arm, and we're going to use our first image. We're going to match our brushing all tension out of the shoulder and neck, like that. And throwing it away and, you know, replacing it with ease. Exactly. And then we're going to shake that arm. And just to make it a little more challenging, also shake the leg of the same side. It's a little bit of a balance exercise. And you can move that arm and leg around. So you're challenging your balance. Very good. Okay. And rest. And now we're going to do something that's really important to improve movement. And it's called noticing what changed after an exercise. <laughs> so now we only did one side, we are gonna do the other side. So anyone feel a difference in the sides? So probably the side you practiced, you shook, you tapped, feels more relaxed, a little more comfortable maybe, a little more aware, yeah? It feels so more there we have it. But now uh, lift your arms up and down, maybe you feel a little more flexible in your shoulder, it's just more comfortable to move, right? Yes. So if movement changes, you know, gets easier, more comfortable, more flexible, we call that training. So this is a very interesting thing. Let's balance on the side we just practiced. So just stand on that leg of the same side you shook your arm. And let's do a little hop on that side. Now let's hop on the other side and see if we feel a difference on the side we didn't practice yet. You feel a difference, yeah? Yes. Probably feel stiffer. So yes. actually, you know, this is a very interesting thing. People say, oh, you know, let's start stretching, let's start strengthening. But shaking and tapping is very good to improve performance. And if you, if you ever watched um, athletics, what do the athletes do just before the race? What do they do just before the race? Exactly. You know, I, I, what I usually say is that they stretch, right? And everyone nods. They don't stretch. <laughs> they don't stretch. <laughs> They tap. So let's do the other side. They tap and they shake because that's going to improve performance. Whereas if you stretch, and I'm not against stretching, just not before um, a race, then you actually reduce um, reaction speed of the muscles. And then we brush like this and brush all tension out. Just imagine you're brushing all tension out of your shoulder and neck and just throwing it away. And replacing it with ease and comfort. And then we're going to shake our arm and our leg. Good. And then there's many variations to this exercise. So this is just a pretty simple version. Then let's shake both arms at the same time and shake the legs. Very good. So that was our little tapping, shaking warm up. So the next thing we're going to do is actually the most challenging exercise uh, that we're going to do today. <laughs> in this short presentation. 
And the instructions are to do nothing except feel your body. So what do I mean with that? I mean, feel your breathing, feel your posture, feel your tension level. So just feel. And what we're not going to do is think about stuff. We do that plenty. Thinking, 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 right? So right now, it's just feeling and not thinking. And we're going to do that for one minute. Here we go. Three, two, one, and welcome back. So how did that go? Were you able to feel your body for the whole time? Or did you drift off, start to think about something? So for a lot of people, this is a very challenging exercise. It's called paying attention to your body, being focused, being present. So what's the connection between that skill, being present in your body and improving movement is the next big question. Why is that key to improve movement? Well, there's many good answers, but one answer is, well, if, you, if, you can't, if you're not feeling what you're doing, you can't improve what you're doing because you don't know what you're doing in the first place. You can only improve something if you can feel it and notice, okay, is this the right way of doing that move or exercise or not, right? So being present, noticing is super important. Of course, we have these proprioceptors and they're switched on for automatic movement, blah, blah, blah. But you can use your brain power to speed up your improvements by becoming aware of your body. And that's one of the things, of course, that's very big in science. It's called body schema. So the body schema is basically your geometric design awareness of your body. Do you know where some of the parts are? Do you know where some of the important structures are? For example, if you take your fingers, right, take your fingers, and place the tips of your fingers on your hip joint right now. Exactly. So a lot of people, they will point here or here or here, but your hip joints are actually not there. Your hip joints are here, here in the middle of this crease. So let's make a crease like that, slide your hands like that, and your hip joints are actually in the middle of that crease. So here we have a femur, and if I put that here on my leg, you can see, Oh, the hip joints are much more at the front and center of the body. So, for example, I've trained a lot of dancers. They do a lot of leg movement. And most of them think their hip joints are here, there, and so forth. So if the picture in your head of where things are in your body when they move is incorrect, then, of course, you're going to have a conflict. You're not going to be able to move as well. So, you know, say move from your hip joint, but they don't know where their hip joint is or it's in the wrong place, not going to work. So that's called body schema and it's huge in science and we kind of just skip over it. So people who are more aware of their body move better to, you know, say it simply, but you have to teach people in a differentiated way the basic things. Your hip joints are here. This is a classic, by the way. Exercise and imagery bouncing on your femur head. So here have these femur heads and just bouncing on the femur heads for even for posture, like that, like bouncing on two balls. So the femur heads, you know, being balls like that. So body schema is a huge thing. Good. So that will improve movement. What else will improve movement? Well, we just actually already talked about it. Um, one of the skills that's closely related to imagery is called self-talk. What does that mean? Well, every day, on average, you have about 60,000 thoughts. And the question is, how many of those thoughts are beneficial to your movement or how you feel about your body or yourself? So have you ever had thoughts where you were thinking, I shouldn't be thinking that, right? So we've all had that experience. So self-talk is very big in sports psychology. All winning athletes know how to use self-talk, motivational self-talk, instructional self-talk, and all these kind of things, right? So let's give that a try. Let's do an example of that. So everyone, and, you know, just lift your arms up like this and lower them down. Very simple movement. So shoulder flexion, basically. 
Yeah, some scapular movement, if you know what that is, so up and down. Good. So now when we practice self-talk, let's just, you know, imagine that we're trying things out. There's no right and wrong right now. There's just trying out different words. So why don't we all say, my shoulders feel comfortable and flexible, and my arms are just floating up. Feels effortless, effortless floating up of arms. And my shoulders feel comfortable and relaxed. Good. Notice how that felt. Now, let's change our mind entirely about that. Okay, I don't agree. You know, no, that's not how I feel. I actually feel the opposite. My shoulders feel tight and gripped and tense. And my arms feel heavy and tired. So everyone, please lift your heavy and tired arms. There we go. Notice how tight your shoulders are as you do this. And so when you do that, most people will notice, oh, that's interesting. My arms do feel a little heavier. They do, my shoulders do feel a little tighter and all that, yeah? So let's try another one. Move your shoulders front and back. So, you know, in movement, this is called protraction, retraction. And now say my shoulders are flexible and comfortable. And, you know, my shoulder blades are gliding on my back. And now stop, different world. Now say my shoulder blades are stuck. My shoulder blades are gripped. My muscles are tight. So everyone move your tight muscles, your gripped shoulders front and back. And just about everyone will feel the difference. So it's very relevant what you're thinking while you're doing a movement. So this is called self-talk and it's very related to um, one form of imagery called metaphors. So a metaphor is basically when you borrow an experience you have in your life and use it to improve your movement, change movement quality, make it easier, relax yourself or something like that. Let's do an example. So let's lift our shoulders up and down, right? So a nice little shrug, good. Now you could imagine your shoulder blades are slippery bars of soap. So your shoulder blades are slippery bars of soap or a slippery sponge as you do that. So slide your slippery sponge or soap shoulder blades up and down. Now we all know our shoulder blades are not soap, but some people, when they imagine soap and they had they had the experience of slidey and glidey, that will help them to do this. And if you just tell them, okay, relax your shoulders, it doesn't work. They don't know what that is, but they know what slippery soap is. So it's a borrowed proprioception, a borrowed experience you put in your body. Metaphors, we use them all the time in exercise teaching. But that was a so-called internal metaphor, was inside your body. You can also use metaphors outside your body. So let's imagine you have strings attached to your shoulders right here. Um, and these strings are pulling your shoulders up. You're not doing anything. So strings are pulling your shoulders up. You're not doing anything. And when your shoulders are up, then magical scissors come and they cut the string and your shoulders just drop down, right? So strings pulling shoulders up and the string is cut. Plop, exactly. And strings pulling shoulders up and plop. And one more time, strings pulling shoulders up, good, and plop. So those are examples of metaphors. Metaphors can be inside the body, outside the body, and they can be local and global. In other words, they can be in one place or everywhere. We actually already did a local internal metaphor when we say we're bouncing on our femur heads, right? So that's inside our body and the femur heads are balls and we're bouncing, pelvis is bouncing on those balls, right? So that's an internal specific um, metaphor. I'll give you another, I'll give you, we'll do another example um, in a moment. What about an external metaphor? So imagine there's a gust of wind behind you blowing your arms up like that, yeah? Strong gust of wind, whoosh, you know? So that's an external global metaphor. So all around you, something's happening and it's blowing your arms up like that, like that. Of course, there is no wind, but you see, that's the whole point is imagery is a form of training. And, and that seems to be really hard for people to understand. So let me quickly define imagery. So imagery is the self-generated cognitive process 
of creating an experience in your mind, such as metaphors, anatomical imagery, with a training effect. And this training effect can be motor and non-motor. What does it mean? So motor means it improves your flexibility, improves um, force absorption, load transfer, um, all those kind of things. And non-motor means it improves psychological aspects like confidence, concentration, and so forth, right? So it's a self-generated proprioception. That's what we were doing basically before, or exteroception or interoception. It's a self-generated picture, visual picture. And of course, um, imagery works better if it's vivid. So if you can see it and feel it, then it comes alive for you, yeah? So let's move on to anatomical imagery. So anatomical imagery is very different. That's when you imagine your body to be exactly, you know, moving as it is, trying to visualize with as much precision as possible the movement in your body. Let's do the shoulder blades. So a lot of people have no clue of how their shoulder blades move when they lift their arms. I'm sure you do, but um, a lot of people won't. So let's lift your arms and just stay with the same movement. And the first question is, can you feel the shoulder blades, those bones on the back, moving? Yeah? Yes. So you have two of them, and they are moving. Um, how do you feel them moving? Are they moving up, down, out, in, and so forth? Yeah? They're doing all kinds of things. In fact, when you lift your arms, the shoulder blades swing outward like that. It's called upward rotation. It's one of the movements they do. You see that? Like that. So the inferior tip here, the bottom of the shoulder blade is going to swing out like that. So a little bit like a swing. So take your hands for a moment like this to model your shoulder blades. There's another thing we do a lot when training with imagery and improving function. You go like this, you just imagine the shoulder blades rotating outward like that, yeah? Swinging out. And perhaps afterwards we can look at some pictures, some metaphors relating to that. So, so lift your arms and just imagine that rotation of your shoulder blades. Rotation of your shoulder blades. You can imagine the bottom tip of the shoulder blade swinging outward like a pendulum. Now that's already going to be advanced, right? For you to see. That's already a little more advanced for a lot of people. So the bottom tip here is swinging outward like a pendulum like that. Let's see if we can imagine that, yeah? There we go. Good. So anatomical imagery is very precise, but it requires a bit of an introduction. So you have to actually, you know, show the anatomy a little bit like we did with the, with, you can't just say, oh, your hip joints are here. If you show them, here's the femur head. Here's the femur, I put it here, you can see it's right there, it's not out there, there's another bone there, it's called the trochanter, you have to explain. Metaphors you don't necessarily need to explain, but, but anatomical image you have to explain it, uh, but in, in an embodied way. So not just, you know, a lecture, but you have to use some touch, feeling, imagery, so it really gets into the body of the people. Now you can combine all these things, with some self-touch, so touching yourself and being clear, and clear about locations. So one of the things we do um, is called sponging. So we squeeze the muscles in the fascia, and we know, if you know anything about fascia, of course, that's going to reduce viscosity in the fascial tissues. The squeezing, the pressure, the warmth, and, of course, the different fascial planes will become more flexible. So let's take one hand and put it on the other shoulder there, yeah? So my hand is on the shoulder, the thumb is near the neck. And the metaphor we're gonna use is that the shoulder, the shoulder muscles, it's mostly thesis, is a sponge. And we're gonna squeeze water out of that sponge, and then we're gonna let go and imagine water comes back in. So squeezing water out of that sponge, and then water comes back in, yeah? So here we go, squeeze, you're imagining you're squeezing water out, and then water, comes back in like warm water. Let's combine that with a shoulder roll like this. So you're squeezing and then letting go. And of course you can go in both directions. And now most people are able to do two images at the same time. So we're sponging, but you're also matching the shoulder blades sliding on your rib cage like a slippery bar of soap. So 
two images. Some people can do three at the same time. And then let's do a little arm shaking. Just imagine the arm is lengthening like half your chewing gum. Then let's go to the other side and squeeze a little bit like that. Just imagine that shoulder dropping down and these muscles here just stretching like tap your chewing gum. And one more time, let's shake, let's go back again. Good, and then let's come over here and just imagine these muscles lengthening like chewing gum, feel the weight of the arm, very good. And then take your hand away and let's do a little comparison. So do you feel a difference between the shoulders? Probably, right? It's like more dropped, just further down. but. Did that effect movement. Now lift your arms. Do you feel a difference in your arms? Is there more flexibility there? Can you flex that arm more, elevate it more? Imagine you're, you're lifting a weight, a dumbbell. Compare the two sides. Probably the side you practiced has better scapular positioning than the other one, yeah? You need yes. really good, as you know, positioning <laughs> to lift weights like that. But now even more so, okay, so the shoulder's more flexible, it's more relaxed, okay? But now notice the hip joint. So just notice the hip joint on the side you practice. Maybe you can, you can swing your leg forward like that. Hamstrings, hip joint. Notice how that feels and compare it to the other side. Probably on the side we didn't practice, it feels quite a bit stiffer. <laughs> just the hamstrings are tighter and it's not as free. Do you feel any difference there? Yeah? Yes, much looser yeah, on the exactly. so, work side. Wow. How do we release the hamstrings? Well, you know, do some shoulder sponging, right? It's an alternative for people like they stretch and they stretch, but if they're tightening their shoulders, right, there's these so-called non-local effects. So if you're tight here, you're going to be tight down there. So someone is, that's like this, they can stretch their hamstrings, you know, until they're blue in the face, they're not going to have a good effect. So let's just briefly um, stand on the side you practice, and if you hop, you'll also notice you have better elastic recoil, and on the other side, you feel stiffer. So you, you get better recoil, you get a little better force absorption, like that. And all this is not about, wow, this is a cool exercise. This is training people to be more aware of positive change in their body, because if you do that, they will get better at positive change in the body, right? So many people are used to negative change. You know, things get worse as time goes on, right? So you show them, look, look how fast you can improve. You're more relaxed, you're more flexible. You have better balance, all the things you want, right? So that makes people more confident, which is an important part of progress. So how does this exercise go? Let's go to the other side. So you're squeezing an imaginary sponge. And of course, you can do that more vivid, really imagining warm water flowing in and out of that sponge. You've got to be more effective. Then you do it with some shoulder rolling. If you can also imagine the shoulder blade is sliding on your back as you do this. And then, of course, you're also going to slide in the other direction like that. Yeah, very good. Then we're going to do a little shaking like that and squeezing. And, of course, we're breathing freely as we're doing this. And then let's go to the other side. Just a little bit of squeezing. And then let's go back like that one more time. Good. And then back like that, yeah? Good. So in this exercise, we were combining imagery with movement with self-touch. And of course, that's going to be very, very effective like that. And so we go through the body and, you know, we... This was you know, just a little, little bit. And, um, we learned the anatomy this way. So we learned the anatomy through embodiment experience, visualization and touch, because that will improve movement. So an anatomy lecture will not improve movement. It, it's great, but it doesn't. So if you want to improve movement, you have to improve body schema, body awareness. You have to show people um, how things function so they can visualize it. For example, the shoulder blades moving. But I'm gonna see if I can show you some slides. So this is just a free replay for anyone who's watching um, the pelvic floor webinar I did. You just you know take a photo of this link and you just go straight to that page and you can, you can watch those videos and we have plenty more like this, right? So this is just a gift for anyone who's watched is watching and it's free right through there. So let's go to the next slide. 
Did it move on the slides? Do you see the next slide? Yes, sir. Okay, that's very important. Okay, good. So this is what we said before. Mental imagery is a self-generated cognitive process of uh, creating images and metaphors, including envisioning motor tasks with or without actually doing movement. So you mentioned adiokinesis. In adiokinesis, you don't do movement. You lie on the floor. And I think that's really a more advanced flavor because you're not getting any proprioception, and that makes it very difficult for people uh, to use imagery. I'm, I'm a big fan of what I call dynamic imagery. In other words, teaching people, certainly initially, how to use imagery with movement because they have much more of a, a felt experience and they, they can learn much faster like that, yeah? Yes. So dynamic neurocognitive imagery is one of the things we use in the Franco method. So we practice better noticing physical as well as psychological states. We are learning how to use our body structure and, and design uh, more efficiently with correct biomechanics. And we're using evidence-based tools uh, to in, improve performance. So you can see that actually having the experience and imagining the experience is very similar. So this is someone floating in the you know salt water dead sea and this is someone imagining it but it's very interesting that the same brain areas pretty much are used if you're imagining the experience and that explains some of the training effect so when you move you have certain areas of the brain that are activated but when you imagine movement or imagine experience very much the similar areas are activated so it's a form of training without movement. So this is what I was talking about, you know, actually floating in the Dead Sea and imagining it. Okay, good. So here you see some metaphors, you know, obviously we can't grow roots out of our feet, but if you imagine it, um, it'll help your balance and a stream pulling up like that. Um, so it can be very creative using imagery, very creative and very personal. So what works best for you is the best image. Um, also, you can use different perspectives. So there's an internal perspective, there's an external perspective. Um, so here you see looking at, you know, gait characteristics from the outside. Um, so again, as we practiced, the image can be inside the body. So you can also have imagery for the organs. So you have the, what I call the biggest joint in the body. Do you see the long slide? Is it there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the long sliding, uh, the pleura, the long sliding on the pericardium of the heart, which happens like, you know, you, your heart beats 100,000 times a day, you uh, breathe 20,000 times a day, and those two structures have to move next to each other, glide next to each other. That's the most active joint in the body, and we never think about it. And so here we're imaging that joint, and also what happens in movement. And here's an external image. So here we're imagining a ball under the knee, um, helping this ballerina, this dancer to lift their leg. And in fact, we did a study on using imagery with dancers, and we we show that you can improve flexibility with imagery in dance, no stretching involved. And uh, we have a paper on that. So we have quite a few papers that we've uh, published at this point. Uh, and just you know, write me if you want to to get those. And the other cool thing about imagery, yeah, you can use it in sports and training. Uh, this would be a fascial image right here, for example, or you could use it in daily activities. So here, for example, walking up the stairs, imagining the pelvic floor floating you up or a string pulling your knees up like that. And of course, you can uh, combine imagery with props. So this is me right here. And this is uh, Colorado Springs. This is... Uh, the um, weight training center, weightlifting training center in Colorado Springs, and many of these are champions right here. And this is the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. So you can see you can use these things in combination um, to improve proprioception. And here we're using resistance bands as well. Um, so here we have it. Why use imagery? Why use dynamic imagery? Well, it improves flexibility, strength, stability, motivation, concentration, self-confidence, and it's free, always available, and it's adaptable to all needs and situations. But what, why don't more people use imagery? 
So what is, you know, everyone talks about it, mind, body, blah, 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 on and on. But why don't more people use it? Let's just quickly think about that, you know? Um, why don't more people use it? Because to use imagery, you have to be able to change your mind. You know? All, what we did in our warm-up was constantly changing our mind. Okay, so my shoulders are relaxed and flexible. No, my shoulders are tight and grip. If you can't try out different mindsets, you can't use imagery. Sorry. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They have their opinions. They're stuck to their opinions. You know, it's okay. We're going to now try imagining our shoulders are flexible. So say, but they're not. My shoulders are not flexible. They're tight. Well, you're, it won't hurt you to say the word flexible. Is there, is there something damaging to say that word, you know, or imagine it? Oh, you know, so people get so stuck and they can't try out different words and different images. So, but I tell them, well, in anything in life, if you don't have it and you want it, you imagine it. Let's say you want a new apartment, right? And you imagine, oh, I want an extra room. I want a good view and blah, blah, blah. You know, whatever you imagine what you want, but you don't have it at the moment. But with the body, very often it's difficult for people to do that, to say, okay, right now you're tight, but we're going to match it. Flexible shoulders, the shoulders are melting, melting like ice cream, you know? So you have to be flexible in your mind to do imagery. And if you're stuck and you're not willing to do that, you're going to, you know, have difficulty with that. So I think that's worthwhile mentioning. So let's look at some of the, the studies here. So here we go. Here are just a few of the studies I mentioned. So this was a study we did with people um, with Parkinson's and how the Franklin method, you know, dynamic imagery improved body schema, pelvic schema specifically in people with Parkinson's. Um, and this here is the one I mentioned on flexibility in dancers. Um, this is a study did, we did on jumping height. So jumping height was improved faster and more effective with imagery than with strength training. Very uh -huh. interesting, right? That's because you can see it, it's about coordination. So you have the strength, but you're not using it efficiently or appropriately. And of course, you're an expert on that. Um, then the strength doesn't help you. The strength can actually go against you, right? Um, so that was very interesting. Pretty surprised about those results. And this is one of the newest studies here. Um, integrating mental imagery and fascial tissue, uh, conceptualization of research into movement and cognition. So this is the first paper that discusses, well, imagery works so well for muscles to create, you know, positive change in muscle function. It probably also uh, works for fascia. And uh, so now we, if you want to ask some questions, I have a lot more slides I can show you. But if you want, you can also ask some questions and then I can maybe address those also yeah. with some more slides. So first of all, if you actually participated and followed along at home, I know you felt different. Um, and because you just got also you just got a world class education. That was phenomenal. So thank you for, for doing all of that. That was that was amazing. Um, well, all right, so my biggest my biggest question is is so you were a dancer and you were feeling beat up, and yeah. you used imagery to quit hurting and start feeling good. Like how did that? Well, how did how combination did, with movement exactly? <laughs> that, well, that's, well, right. So this is this is a very good question because you see in in the world of exercise. Um, and in dance, but also Pilates yoga and many other methods, a lot of people use imagery, right? But a lot of it, as I discovered, a lot of the images sound anatomically anatomical, but they're incorrect from a biomechanical view. I'll give you a few examples. Like in dance, the teacher says, you know, lift your kneecaps. So you're supposed to lift your kneecaps up. You know, and all the students are doing that because, you know, they think the teacher knows what he's doing. But if you lift your kneecaps, you can't bend your knees because when you bend your knees, the kneecaps, the patellas slide down on the femur in their groups, right? So if you're pulling up all the time, you're getting a conflict between what the body wants to do biomechanically, right, and what is actually efficient in actual biomechanics. 
And I started then to say, just a second, um, that's not, that image sounds anatomical, it's completely wrong, you know? Another one that's used a lot, which, you know, and some of it gets really odd, it's so, so off, right? Um, so, you know, for example, you're supposed to contract your gluteus, right? To improve, you know, pelvic position when you do a, a plie, which is basically a squat, right? So, well, the gluteus is a hip extensor. If you contract the gluteus, right, as a hip extensor, really contracted, you can't flex your hip, you know, it doesn't work. <laughs> so you see all these dancers shoving their knees out of alignment because they can't really flex their hips anymore and ruining their anterior cruciates. They're basically getting ready for an anterior cruciate injury. And, it, and it's in the name of the kind of imagery they've been given. I was starting to scratch my head just a second and there's so much of that going on, yeah? So it, it's really very much an act of, you know, cleaning up the imagery or you're supposed to take your shoulder blades down and in, right? That's the correct position of your shoulder blades. And my answer to that is, well, you're never going to lift your arms then. Because when you lift your arms, as you know, <laughs> the shoulder blades do, does the opposite. They swing, they go outward. They upward rotation, protraction, they slide around the rib cage. If you're holding your, your shoulder blades down and in, you're going to have a huge conflict between what you're thinking in your head and the movement. So there. So that's the number one. And of course, in the psychological area, specifically dancers are always beating themselves up, right? They're not good enough. This is wrong. That's wrong. And of course, if, if you know, let's quickly lift our arms up and down just for a moment like that. Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. That's great. You're doing a great job, Tim. Fabulous. Very good. Okay, stop. Different teacher. Do it again. Lift your arms. That's wrong. Oh my God, that's so wrong. That's so <laughs> bad. That's terrible. Pair back. Oh, awful. Oh my God. Come on, you know, but they're doing that to themselves, right? So there's this huge psychological element as well in, in dance that of them beating themselves up, but of course also happens in other exercise systems and it's imagery, yeah? And, and so number one, using imagery to improve body schema or to become more aware of your body, which is not quite the right word, you know, because what does that mean more aware, right? body scheme is so specifically. So getting to know your body, at least the basics a little better. Where are your hip joints? You know, how do your shoulders move when you lift your arms? Some basic stuff, right? Um, number two, cleaning up your imagery act, um, using the correct picture in your head um, of what's happening when you move, right? So developing correct pictures of movement as you move, and we call that embodying function. So you want to embody your best function. In the Franco method, you know, we have a lot of these things we say, and one of the things we say is um, embodying function improves function. So embodying means feeling, visualizing correct function as you move will make your function better, as opposed to visualizing something completely wrong, right? So we're helping people to visualize and feel the correct biomechanics as they move. So embodying um, better function like that. And to achieve that, as we said before, you don't use lecture, you use images, touch, you show the bones, show how they move, so people can see it, visualize it, feel it, and start moving in a more correct way. I think everyone needs it. I think everyone, you know, should have a basic instruction, okay, what are some of the basics of how the body moves best? You know, your back, your spine, your pelvis, your knees, your feet, like that, right? So it's body hygiene, so to speak. We think training will solve everything, but you know exactly that training itself without an expert like you giving feedback can go very wrong, right? So train, how many athletes are injured? I mean, how many, the injury rate in dance is 89%. 80, 90% of professional dancers are injured, but it's not an injury, oh, one of the lights, you know, in the theater fell on their foot. No, it's called overuse injury. And what that means is you've used your body incorrectly for a long period of time and then suddenly something starts hurting. That's where the problem is. So the solution is to teach these dancers and everyone else early on um, 
the correct image. But it was the same in Pilates. When I came into Pilates, they didn't really have anatomy. Now there's everyone, Pilates is teaching anatomy, the same with yoga. But when I started 30 years ago, there wasn't. There was just the teacher's opinion. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And you know how the student felt about it or if it felt comfortable, no one mentioned it. I mean, there were actually two articles in the New York Times about young girls needing hip replacements from yoga, right? There were two actually articles. How can that happen? It doesn't mean yoga is great, but if the teacher and the student don't understand healthy hip and pelvic function, even the best mythology can damage your body. And the problem is not understanding function, biomechanical function. Of course, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the same, especially if you're going to work with weights, if you're going to put more uh, stress onto the body like that, it better, you better move with a lot of finesse. And the same thing I experienced then in Pilates. I mean, I'll give you an example. In Pilates, you know, they talk about neutral spine. I'm fine with neutral spine. But let's talk about <laughs> Let's talk about opti optimal control of movement. There is a lot of science on that. And optimal control of movement requires movement. Low trance requires movement. Force absorption requires movement. No force absorption without movement, right? Um, function requires movement. And then you're telling people not to move their spine when they're flailing their legs and arms around. And I'm just going... Whoever just like, what? And, you know, and of course, if you say something, it's like, you know, like that. But I was brave enough to speak up and say, sorry, you know, I'm all for neutral spine. But humans, when they move their legs, it, it, this is a large lever. It's going to have an effect on the pelvis and spine, right? Mm -hmm. On and on and on, right? And, of course, now it's a lot better. You know, I started teaching class and yoga, yoga, yoga teachers like 30, 35 years ago, and they've adopted a lot of things. And one of the things I teach is called the bone rhythms. So the bone rhythms is the natural way bones and joints move, trade healthy and safe movement. You know, one example is auto, automatic rotation in the knee, right? So that's another good one. So um, a lot of people are instructed, you know, in dance, but always turn your fever out. The slight problem is when you extend your knees, the femur turns in relative to your tibia, right? And that, of course, is going to wreak havoc on your hip joints and so forth. So bone rhythms. The other big thing in the Franklin Method is we first work on the things you do most of the time. Because if we first organize and make more efficient the things you do often, you're going to get the best improvement, right? So you're going to start with things you do occasionally, like, okay, that'll do something. But let's first start with what you do most often and see if we can get that in order or just improve it. What do you do most often? You think and you image. You breathe. You posture. You walk. Those are what you do, yeah? So let's first look at that. And, of course, all biomechanics is based on walking because this is a walking machine. We were made for walking, right? So... Right we on. were not, sorry, made for yoga and Pilates or ballet, right? We were made for walking. So those things should be looked at from the aspect of walking, not the other way around, right? So first of all, say, okay, we should know a little bit about breathing, you know. And, and the thing is, I would never approach that by telling someone how to breathe. It's always a collaboration if we do like a breathing class. So you say, okay, why do we breathe, you know? Why is that? Well, people say, oh, to live. And then we talk a little, well, without oxygen, no energy and, you know, fuel the body, blah, blah, blah. ATP, and explain that. Okay, good. So next thing, what is the most important muscle of breathing? The diaphragm, right? which a lot of people cannot visualize at all. And then you go, okay, so it's the most important muscle like in your body for survival, except the heart maybe, right? Or like that. Um, so if that stops working, um, you're gone. And, you know, you go into the gym and you're looking for the diaphragm machine, right? This is the machine for the pack and there's a machine for the lats and there's, right? Where's the diaphragm? Nothing. What they tell you, like, oh, breathe. Breathe, right? And that's it. I mean, just think about it. If you would go, um, you know, into the gym and say, I, I want to, like, an exercise for my biceps and the trainer says, Use your biceps. 
you should buy some shoes. I'm not paying you anything. You know, what? Right? It's not enough. It's where are the stretches for the diaphragm? Where's the strengthening of the diaphragm, right? So I started developing, okay, how to release it, how to stretch it, how to strengthen it, you know, step by step like this, like this. I thought, why am I doing this? I'm like a nobody, I think, you know, and like, of course, afterwards, I go, oh, it's so obvious. Yes. Oh, it's obvious that, oh, God, yeah, of course, sorry, missed that part. Like, well, yeah, you know, and we, so that's sort of how it got developed, very organic. I thought, I think it's logical. The person you have zero control of what's going on in your head, you're going to have very little control of your movements, right? So we have to at least know the rudiments there. So what you're going on in your head has an effect on your body. Sorry. Let's, you know, stress is the biggest example like that. And then when you exercise, how you're thinking very much influences the benefit of the exercise. And, and these days, no athlete is going to win without good imagery skills. In fact, you know, in sports psychology, you're always looking for what is a predictor of good performance? And what is a good predictor of good performance? Good imagery skills. So if someone's better at imagery, they tend to be more of a winner and people want to be winners, yeah? But you have to teach them, okay, what is imagery, right? Self-generated cognitive process of creating experience in your mind. Um, how do you make it more effective? How do you make it more vivid? What types of imagery are there? Um, blah, 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 practice. It, it's, it's a bit of a, you have to get involved and learn that. I think every trainer uh, of, of movement should know the basics of imagery because cueing is imagery. And I wrote a book on that, The Art of Science of Cueing. Yeah. So cueing is, you use imagery, right? Uh, but the imagery, as we said, should be biomechanically supportable. It should be evidence-based, not your personal fantasy. Um, I always say, if you want to create a new method, you don't really need new movements. You need new imagery, right? So a class example is bridging, you know, bridging the exercise. So when I first encountered bridging, it was just an exercise, bridging, right? But it can be a Pilates exercise, it can be a yoga exercise. You probably find it in many other methods. But what is different? The imagery, the focus, where you put your attention. That's what, that's what it ends up being. I mean, who's inventing new movement, you know, brand new movement? I mean, it's like that. It's just the same movements, but different way of focusing, different way of attention, all those kind of things. Yeah, that's really what changes. So let's first work on the things we do most often, right? Walking, hip joints, and so forth. Let's help people to embody good function and then take that good function into what you're doing, you know, Tim, and especially if you're going to load the body more with heavier weights and more resistance, yeah? So those are some of them, but of course, many more. And be student-centered. So interview people. So what's your experience of, uh, you know, your breathing? Like that, not just always telling people what to do. People are being told what to do sufficiently. Don't tell people what to do. Give them, give them an experience of what feels better for them, what works better for them. It's a big difference, yeah? So instead of me telling you, relax your shoulders, right? We do an exercise and afterwards ask you, do you feel your shoulders are relaxed? And they go, yeah. And then they know what relaxed shoulders are. Until someone had the experience, they don't know what it is. You, you can't give instructions like that. Or for example, okay, we really need to improve your, your function of your diaphragm. Oh, really? You know? <laughs> like, okay, why, what? You know, you have to give them ex an experience. And if you want, we can do two little exercises at the end to pre up the diaphragm, just two or little, three little things. Yeah. But do you have any more questions? No, that, that, this has been fantastic. Um, if somebody wants to learn from you, um, where, what can they do? Where can they go? Uh, well, you can study the Franca Method. We have online courses, online trainings, webinars, everything. You just go to francamethod.com. It's all there. Um, you, can, you can go and get the free thing I showed you. Um, I can put that up on the screen again if you want, and then then that'll direct you to the Franklin Method. But just go to franklinmethod.com and look at the selection. We have another 
um, training starting where you become a Franco method trainer, so an expert in how to teach imagery, dynamic imagery, and how to teach people how to embody their function. And that you can apply to anything you're doing. So if you're a yoga teacher, pause teacher, coach, trainer, swimmer, whatever, um, you can do that. So I can just pop this awesome. up one more time. It's this slide here. Just a second. Yeah, just write to us if you have questions. Here you go. No, but you know, another cool thing in why I, of course, I would like the Frank method because I teach it. But when you teach the Frank method, you're always doing the imagery yourself. So it's actually very therapeutic for yourself to teach Frank method, right? So just take a, a picture of this here if you're watching. Um, yeah, it's very therapeutic because you're always doing it kind of yourself like that, always. Um, yeah. And of awesome. course, it can be done with movement, without movement. So if you have an injury and you can't move a part of the body, you can still do imagery. And in fact, we know that focus, and I'm sure you know that. Thing. I mean, focusing on a muscle uh, increases its activation. So if you focus on a muscle um, and, you know, if they've done electromyography with that, you know, you get just a little more activation in the muscle, um, which means if you can move, you still get that muscle going a little bit. Of course, if you're training and you're focusing on the, the muscle or muscle group that you're training, you're gonna get slightly faster strength gains because the focus itself is getting more of those motor units going. And that's one of the big things we're always trying to do like that. So focusing on the muscle, knowing where the muscle is, and of course, pros in, in the bodybuilding world, they know that, right? They often, yes. they touch the muscle, they have a partner touch, blah, 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 right? But anyone can benefit from that. Anyone, it doesn't just have to be, you know, because especially if you look at the aging population, what, what is one of the things about aging is that you lose muscle mass. So you have to work harder to maintain that mass. So using focus on the muscles can be very helpful for that, yeah? Yes, this is awesome. Do you want to close us out with those diaphragm uh, exercises oh, sure. you were talking absolutely. about? Absolutely, oh, absolutely. Okay, so just a little bit of diaphragm here. So first off, where is the diaphragm located? It's about here, right? So the diaphragm. And um, what is the function of the diaphragm? So here you have the lung. This is a lung, right? So the function of the diaphragm is to pull the lung down, to expand the lung. The lung itself can't expand on its own. In fact, the lung wants to shrivel up. So the diaphragm is going to, my hand here, the diaphragm is going to pull the lung down. The ribs will pull it out, but the diaphragm will pull it down. That creates a vacuum, and that draws the air in here through the nose and mouth. So humans are negative air pressure breathers as opposed to, for example, frogs, which are positive air pressure breathers. So if you don't have good diaphragm movement, you're not gonna get much, much oxygen into your lungs. And as we know, good oxygen saturation is a predictor of lifespan. And so that's a nice little thing that gets people a little scared and more interested in improving in their diaphragm movement. So it is mostly a muscle. And so before you train a muscle, the first thing you need is a little bit of relaxation. Remember we did that already? We shook our arm, do it one more time. So if you shake your arm like that, and you stop, immediately afterwards, the arm feels a little more relaxed and aware. So we're gonna do the same thing with our diaphragm. Be brave in this exercise. We're gonna be shaking our diaphragm. Shake the diaphragm. Very difficult for some people. They're so stuck in that diaphragm, so let's shake it. And make a sound so you can hear your diaphragm, right? And I've taught this ex these exercises to swim teams, and they do it before swimming to free up the diaphragm. Now we have an exercise called the diaphragm trampoline, where we kind of bounce up and down. We imagine the diaphragm bouncing up and down like the surface of a trampoline. And this exercise goes like this. Uh, 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 uh. Very good, just bounce the diaphragm. Uh, 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 uh. And then shake it a little bit. Uh, uh. Good. 
And right after that, you'll notice your breathing just is a little more relaxed. A little bit deeper naturally, but you also might notice your posture has improved. Good. And what's also interesting is your focus has probably improved. So just try 10 seconds of just feeling your body and not thinking. And it's probably a little easier now. Since a lot of the people watching might have a little bit of lower back tension, why don't we do one little thing for the lower back? And I explain one more thing about the Franklin method. So when you want to improve something, you always go through four steps. Um, we call it the four steps. You know? <laughs> the first step is where am I at? The second step is how would I like it to be? The third step is what are the tools I have? And there can be imagery tools, movement tools, exercise tools, self-touch tools. And then use one of those tools. And fourthly, did that work? And if it didn't work, well, then use another tool. So for this, we're going to use touch and imagery for our lower back. So in the lower back, of course, you have the huge thoracolumbar fascia and you have the erector spinae. And we know from research that the different layers of fascia there, the fascia belonging to the erector spinae and the fascia belonging to the latissimus dorsi can get stuck. And that can be one reason, stuck to each other, can be one reason for back pain. So we're gonna free that up. We're gonna imagine lots of mobility there in our lower back. We're gonna use our knuckles, you see this, and we're gonna rub back and forth with our knuckles on the lower back. I'll show you how. So you rub back and forth, you can use quite a bit of pressure. Then you're gonna flex and extend like that. Flex and extend, very good. And you can also move your pelvis a little bit if you want. You move your pelvis a little bit like that. Good. And then you're going to rub up and down. Go to the side. I would do this, recommend doing this every morning. Good. To free up the lower back fascia. And then we're going to finish with a nice glute tap. Tap your glutes while you're doing a little squat, strong tap of the glute because the glute fascia is also connected to the lumbar fascia. There we go. And then just a few little pops like that as you're tapping your glutes, tap your lower back, tap your glute, and tap your lower back. There we go. Ah, and now notice your posture, notice your lower back, notice your pelvic posture. So I think many of you will now notice how the lower back is a little more released. The lower back feels a little more lengthened and dropped. Do you feel that? Yeah? Yes, Just absolutely. a little more lengthened, a little more release. So great thing to do every morning, right? Just to free up that lower back. This is going to reduce the viscosity in um, the connective tissue there, which will allow the muscles to work and collaborate better in a smooth way, right? There we have it. Okay, that for your lower back. And it's been great. Thank you very much. Okay, and Thank if you, you ever need a mood lift, right? And remember that that inflammation follows mood. Or another thing people don't think about, what is a stronger predictor of back pain, an MRI or a mood questionnaire? So a question, you know, a questionnaire, how's your mood, you know, happy, not happy, or an MRI, what predicts back pain more strongly? The mood questionnaire. <laughs> People don't think about those things, right? So people who tend to be frustrated and so forth, unhappy with something, uh, they tend to have more back pain. So this is a very simple exercise to improve your mood. Even if you're in a bad mood, do this. And it's called exercise cheering. So when you cheer, you do this. So everyone, let's do that as if you're cheering. So if you go like this, like that, Right? Arms up and down and think I'm cheering, but who am I cheering for? I'm cheering for myself. So, Tim, you're cheering for yourself and you're thinking, go, Tim, you know, I'm thinking, go, Eric, great webinar. We had so much fun. We learned a lot. Yay, yay, yay. Right? And then after that, you know, you're kind of smiling a little bit like this. Great mood lifting exercise, right? Because posture and mood, of course, are very connected. So, there we have it. Little mood lifter right there, and of course, 
anytime you feel you need a little lift or if you have a lot of sitting work, you just occasionally do that work right away. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me and uh, love to hear from you in the future. Thank you so much for doing this. This was so much fun and just what an education. So thank you very much, Eric. This has been My great. pleasure. Great. Thank you for the invitation and wonderful meeting you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.